Hello, everyone. Welcome back again to our uh, uh, Sabbath School presentation for uh, lesson number three, uh, July 10 uh, to 16 for the Sabbath morning, July 17, the third quarter, uh, 2021. And so uh, this morning, uh, we're going to talk about the roots of restlessness. Uh, uh, the interesting subject that we have too, but uh, uh, before we begin, uh, I'd like to uh, start a word of prayer, with a word of prayer. Uh, this Lord this morning, uh, the Lord this morning, as uh, we begin to present this uh, subject uh, in this uh, video presentation, may it be that as we discuss the details and uh, the, the sidelines and and, and issues that uh, we're going to talk about uh, will open our hearts and our minds to clarify uh, the idea of our human problems, uh, the, the sinful problems of humanity, that we may be able, Lord, to, to, to see the problems that's causing uh, some issues uh, in our community as a church, as a family, and may be that as uh, we talk about this, uh, your Holy Spirit will lead us, guide us into the truth that we may open our eyes, that we may be able, Lord, to, uh, to, to understand uh, and, and grow out of this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, uh, so our lesson, the roots of uh, uh, restlessness, uh, we have been talking about, you know, the uh, uh, rest in Christ and most likely, probably, uh, we think about, uh, you know, when we talk about rest, uh, we talk about the Sabbath and stuff like that. But the author is trying to, to, to get another perspective of what it means to uh, rest in Jesus Christ. And so, uh, let me uh, uh, present here the, the outline of our discussion uh, today. Uh, <clears throat> outline of our discussion is that I'm going to uh, give you a brief introduction and then uh, Jesus brings the vision. Uh, this is an interesting subject here. And then self, selfishness. And then uh, ambition. Uh, is it wrong to have ambitions, you know? Hypocrisy. Uh, and then uh, approaching restlessness. And then we're going to summarize our discussion so uh, uh, this week's study, we want to discover some of the roots of restlessness. There are many things that can prevent from finding true rest in Jesus. Some of these are obvious and don't require much attention. Others may be less obvious to us that we may not always be conscious of the attitudes and actions that separate us from our Savior. Let me give you a hint and example. Uh, a few months or a few weeks ago, uh, uh, we had a uh, big pine tree in front of our house. And uh, I noticed that uh, the, 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 some of the concrete in the driveway are popping up uh, for no reason at all. And even the street uh, that is on the cul-de-sac, uh, you, know, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the asphalt is, you know, bulging and stuff like that. So we noticed that then the, the city inspector said the, the root of the tree are damaging the, the, the underneath of your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, concrete and stuff like that, even the road. So you see, when we talk about roots, you cannot see it, but the problem exists down under. And sometimes uh, we, not, we may not always be conscious of the attitudes and actions that separate us from the Savior. It damages, and you know, the roots that causes all this problem has to be removed. And so, you, uh, based on my uh, uh, big pine tree, I have to cut it in order to, you know, to, to further damage the, the, the whole structure of the front of my house, and including the foundation of the house, because it's already beginning to destroy or damage uh, the surroundings. So uh, this is what we are talking about uh, this morning. So our key text 
is found in James 3.16. It says, uh, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and very vile practice. And so James, uh, who was uh, a pioneer of the Christian church right there in the first century Christians, uh, where after Jesus uh, left uh, for heaven, uh, had observed within the church that... uh, uh, disorder and, and vile practice are caused by jealousy, selfish ambition that exist within the community, and it is not a healthy. Uh, it's not a healthy environment. It doesn't, you know, uh, it, it it damages the relationship, and all these are, uh, you know, cause. Uh, and so we need to talk about this uh, in in essence, really, to uh, to begin with. So. In this week's lesson, The Roots of Restlessness, we will study attitudes that are often hidden from sight and raise their ugly heads from time to time. Attitudes such as pride, selfishness, unhealthy ambition, uh, because there are ambitions that are healthy. Unhealthy ambition, hypocrisy too, often characterize the lives of Christians and tarnish a witness. The Apostle Paul tells us to look diligently, lest anyone fall short of this grace of God, lest any of the root of bitterness uh, springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Roots of evil remain in all our hearts. These roots, if not dealt with, produce shoots, which then produces evil fruits. This week we will carefully examine and, and analyze uh, a few of these roots and study ways to recognize them and then by God's grace root them out of our lives. So that is our goal uh, this morning. Uh, study them and, and hopefully that it will give us an insight that will root them out and remove them from our lives so that it will not damage far, it will not cause damage further. So our Sunday's lesson Jesus brings division, and in, in Matthew ten thirty four to thirty nine, what does Jesus mean when he says that he did not come to bring peace but to bring a sword? How do you square this with this title, Prince of Peace? How is it that the preaching of love can lead to division and strife? What did Jesus mean when he told his followers, "Take up your cross"? How do you do that in practice? So, uh, in here, let's read the text. Let's read the text. Matthew 10, 34 to 39. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be the members is in is, is, is in whole household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves the son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their lives for my sake will find it. See, in this case, a casual glance at Jesus' statement in this uh, text, Matthew 10, 34 to 39, may cause confusion. If Jesus is the Prince of Peace, why did he say that he came not to bring peace to this earth but a sword? Why did they indicate that a son, man, foes shall, you know, man's foes shall be the of his own household? It is within the house. And why does he say, he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me? There are several major issues here. Jesus wanted his followers to recognize the cost of discipleship. And when an individual accepts Christ and is committed to follow him, the devil is angry. We should not be surprised when there is opposition to the gospel. We have declared war on Satan 
and are engaged in battle with all the forces of hell. Jesus is pointing out in these passages that peace, true peace, comes from the follow, following him in the middle of the battle. The issues there are loyalty and allegiance. Although Jesus invites each one of us to respect our families, we have a higher loyalty. Peace floods into our hearts when we place our, our, our place Christ first in our lives and have the assurance of his presence. Look at a uh, member of Jesus' own family. They did not, uh, what they did to him in, in John 1.11, he came to his own home and his own family did not welcome him. In fact, <clears throat> they told him that he had devil to be, uh, to be so describing his father and that they killed him to silence him. We need to remember that as we have mentioned several times already in this conversation, the ones who rejected Christ and preferred Satan's picture of God were the most pious group of Sabbath-keeping people, tight-paying, health-reforming, Bible-studying Adventists the world has ever known. Peter warns that those who accept the true picture of God may expect similar treatment and, and, and even suffer somewhat as Christ did. And do not be surprised, according to Peter in First Peter 4, 12 to 14, he said, do not be surprised at the painful tests you are suffering. Rather, be glad that you are sharing Christ's suffering. Happy are you if you are insulted because, of, because you are Christ's followers. This means that the glorious spirit, the spirit of God is resting in you. So, uh, you know, it's kind of difficult to understand that why, because really, uh, this is so, so common uh, within the household. When somebody believes and follows Jesus Christ, there is a conflict in the family. And that's what Jesus is saying. And that's what Jesus is that the, the son, uh, you know, uh, father, uh, against the father, the daughter against the mother, and, and the in-laws against in-laws. And uh, man's enemies will be the members of his own household. So this is one of the issues that we have to face. That's why Jesus said that uh, I have, I, I, I know, I, I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, because there is a conflict between, you know, the truth of loving Jesus Christ and following Him, and you know, the, and it makes friction, the idea of a relationship in, in there. So. That's what Jesus is uh, trying to, to portray in, in, in the idea of uh, conflict within uh, the community, specifically within the family. So, Armandes, listen, selfishness. <clears throat> the lesson suggests three main roots of restlessness, selfishness, ambition, and hypocrisy. And we are going to deal this uh, uh, the rest of the two at the, uh, in the next uh, uh, lesson uh, subject. And let's read uh, uh, Luke 13 to 21. This is a long uh, uh, story here. And the, uh, the question is, is planning for the future selfish? Does it express disregard for God's kingdom? What exactly is Jesus warning about here? How does Philippians 2, 1 to 8 offer a key to avoiding selfishness and greed. We all need a certain amount of money in order to survive, right? But why does it seem that no matter how much we have, we always want more? So let's read the, the text in Luke 12, uh, 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Tell me, my brother, uh, the, the divide inheritance with... Tell me, my brother, to divide the inheritance. And Jesus replied, man, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> who appointed me a judge or a bitter, uh, you know, arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life, life does not consist 
in an abundance of possessions. And he told them in this parable, <clears throat> the ground of the certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, there is, that's, this is what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I will tear down my barns, build a bigger ones, and there will I store my surplus again, grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. So uh, this text implies a very, uh, you know, uh, a very uh, important uh, parable uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke and is told in a response to an anonymous question from the audience. Ask about the question regarding an inheritance. And Jesus responds by rejecting the role of an arbiter between the brothers. Instead, he opts to put his finger on a bigger underlying problem, namely selfishness. He digs deeper to show the root mass underneath our individual actions. By focusing solely on his own needs and ambition, the anonymous rich man of Jesus' parable forgot to take into consideration unseen heavenly realities, bigger, better, and more or not the foundation of principles of God's kingdom. Paul offers us a glimpse into what motivated Jesus as he decided to become our substitute. Christ's life or self-sacrificial loving service stands in direct contrast to the two brothers in Luke 12, 13 to 15. Those, these two self-seeking young men were arguing about the inheritance they were to receive from their father's estate. One of the brothers came to Jesus and asked him to mediate their dispute. Jesus refused, clearly pointing out that true peace and joy come from giving, not from grasping. Let me repeat it again. Jesus refused, clearly pointing out that true peace and joy comes from giving, not grasping. We are truly happy when we make others happy not when we try to manipulate them to make ourselves happy. So uh, that is the issue that, uh, and when we talk about this rich young man, I mean the, 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 the man that is in parable, who built a house, Jesus was saying that it is not, it is not good for you to think about yourself. Because the text says that, and I'll say to my, to my servant, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And that is the attitude of our society today. Take life easy because I have enough money and, and drink and be merry. And so what God said to him, you fool. In essence, really, this is how we'll be with whoever stores things for themselves. So uh, selfishness is one of the roots of restlessness. We become restless when we are selfish. And that's why Jesus is saying that the, the true remedy of selfishness is give, giving. Give it up. And you know, and this, this is against the grain of a very common attitude or, or philosophy of the society in, in, this business, in the world of uh, ours. This is, that's why uh, when I was uh, still working, uh, people are asking me uh, about, are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Uh, you know, something like uh, uh, helping the, the, the needy. And because uh, all they think about is about themselves. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And so... Uh, Beyond that context, uh, uh, 
it is very important for us to understand that selfishness causes restlessness. The next lesson, uh, the next subject is choose the, the ambition. In Luke chapter 22, 14 to 30, this is a long uh, story. Why on this solemn occasion did the disciples get a sidetrack to focus on human greatness? Why is this digression mentioned in the Gospel of Luke's version of the story? How does a focus on the cross impact our natural human desire for self exaltation Here, uh, notice, uh, let's read uh, Luke 22, 14 to 30. Uh, it says here, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And, and the, Jesus is talking about it. Luke is relating a story here about <coughs> the, the last supper that Jesus did it for the disciples. For I tell you, he said, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. And uh, for I tell you, you will not drink again it from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body for you, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is... Is, is with mine on the table. And the son of man who, uh, who, who will go as a spin, decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. He is talking about Judah. And they began to question among themselves which of them might be and who would do this. Uh, a dispute also arose among them to which of them was considered to be the greatest. And Jesus said to them, uh, the king of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at table, the one who, is, who serves? Is it not the one who at the table, but I am among you as one of who, the one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred on me. So that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, sit on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So here the story of the disciples bickering, bickering about who will be the greatest? You know, ambitious. Is, there, is it wrong to be ambitious? During the Last Supper, at one of the most solemn moments in human history, the disciples were still debating who could be the greatest in the kingdom. On the eye of Christ's betrayal and trial, they still believed he was going to establish an earthly kingdom. And if he was... They wanted first place in this new kingdom. This is not the first time where there was rivalry among them over who would be the greatest in this kingdom. There is a story in Matthew 20, 20 to 28 that reveals the heart of the Christian Christianity today. It powerfully describes the essence of what it means to be a Christ follower. And here is the background of the story. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. For the final time, he was unsuccessfully tried to explain to his disciples that he soon will be rejected, tried, falsely accused, and crucified. For some reason, <clears throat> their presupposition about the Messiah have kept them from understanding the nature of his mission. They felt their what Jesus says through the mistaken ideas of earthly greatness. 
that swirl around their heads. Their ideas of prominence in a new kingdom and the worldly greatness are the basis for James and John's mother's request, you know, in Matthew 20, 21. Uh, James and John, along with Peter, were part of Christ's inner circle. They were the closest companion, compatriots. Wasn't it logical for James and John to think that if Jesus was going to Jerusalem to set up his eternal kingdom, they, they more than anyone else deserved to be near him on his throne, right? They had been nearest to him throughout his ministry. They were his confidants, his closest followers. They, they believed that they deserved this position of honor and privilege. And the other disciples were obviously distressed over this attempt by James and John to elbow their way into the first place of the kingdom. And Jesus' response is timeless. It speaks of the heart of authentic Christianity, calling the disciples to himself. Jesus said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. So, but whoever desires to become great among you, let them be your servant. And whoever desires to be the first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Unfortunately, it seems that the disciples had not yet learned this lesson by the time Jesus ate the last supper with them. Their bickering and inviting ruined a moment of perfect communion and was never to be repeated. And how did the Son of God treat them? <clears throat> did, did, did he child them uh, for the childish behavior? Or scold them for their unwillingness to wash each other's feet? Instead, the whole universe was watching as their creator, uh, the, the one they worship, arose, got a basin and a towel. And the supreme creator got down on his knees and washed a dozen pairs of dirty feet. He even washed the feet of the betrayal, Judas. Think what it says about God that he would treat them in this way. Jesus could have looked at them and said, you don't believe my father would be willing to do this, do you? And so, uh, because he said, he who has seen me has seen the father. And so, Ellen White in her uh, comments here, Christ, in the zero ages, Christ was establishing a kingdom on different principles. He called them not, to authority, but to, not to authority, but to service. The strong to bear the infirmities of the weak. Power, position, talent, and education placed on the procedure under the greater obligation to serve his fellows. So uh, this is what Jesus' kingdom is all about. That uh, ambition in can... can can be a positive aspect of, uh, of our lives. But negative ambition where you step on others' uh, shoulder to, 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 to go higher is, is another thing. And the, the bickering and, the, and you know, the, 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 the idea of uh, service is not in the minds of the disciples. Instead, they want to be number one in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, this is not my kingdom is. I am establishing a kingdom of different principles. He called them the authority to service. So this is, uh, you know, uh, the antidote of ambition is that when we are in authority, we are to serve. The so-called that servant leadership, where there is, you know, you are the one serving you as a leader. And, and uh, as a leader... You, you become, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the model of the idea of uh, uh, the ambitious uh, program here. 
So in our Monday's, uh, in our Wednesday's lesson, hypocrisy. Matthew 23, 1 to 13. What does the word hypocrisy mean? What are the four main characteristics of a hypocrite mentioned by Jesus? Is hypocrisy limited to religious leaders? How can one, one learn to see hypocrisy in oneself and eliminate it from one's life? Uh, so this is, uh, uh, let's read the text, Matthew 23, 1 to 13. Uh, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit on the Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. And listen to this. They do not practice what they preach. Remember that. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on the other people's shoulder, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their uh, phylacteries wide and the tassels in their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi or by others. And then, but you are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you going to call uh, to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah, and the greatest among you will be your servant. Again, Jesus is saying, uh, the greatest among you is uh, to be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees and, and hypocrites. Jesus, this is strong words. You shut your door in the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will let others enter who are trying to. So uh, this text, a hypocrite, according to Jesus, a hypocrite is somebody who play acts, who wants to appear to be somebody he or she is not. The term is used seven times in Matthew 23 in a discourse in which Jesus public, publicly shames the scribes and the Pharisees, the very center of a Jewish religious leadership. The gospel shows us Jesus offering grace and forgiveness to adulterers, tax collectors, prostitutes, and even murderers, but he demonstrated little tolerance for hypocrites. And Jesus associates four characteristics which the scribe and the Pharisees in the, in the spectrum of, uh, what is this, in the spectrum of Judaism in the first century, the Pharisees represented the conservative religious right. They were interested in the written and oral law and emphasized ritual purity. On the other side of the spectrum are the Sadducees, a group of mostly wealthy leaders, often associated with the elite priestly class. They were highly Hellenized, and they spoke Greek and were at home in Greek philosophy and did not believe in the judgment or afterlife or resurrection. We would describe them as liberals. Both groups were guilty of hypocrisy. And... So uh, he, Jesus, uh, he, according to Jesus, we are hypocrites if we don't do what we say. Number two, when we make religion harder for others without applying the same standards to ourselves. And number three, when we want others to applaud our religions religious favor. And then the last one is, when we require honor and recognition that belongs only 
to our Heavenly Father. So this is what Jesus is saying. Uh, he defines who are the hypocrites. Let me repeat it again. Uh, if we don't do what we say, you know, you, you know, say, don't do this and yet, uh, you know, uh, do this and yet you, you don't do it. When we make religion harder. And so this is what uh, the leaders of the church during uh, Jesus Christ's time, uh, they make even the Sabbath observance very difficult to follow because it's burdensome. Instead of lightening the, the load, it becomes burden. And when we come and when we want others to applaud a religious fervor, we, we, we like uh, to, you know, be called doctor. We're called, you know, professor. Uh, sometimes, uh, of course, uh, you know, we, we, we earned those, those degrees. And yet, uh, when we use it in, because one time, I met, uh, I met uh, somebody uh, somewhere there in uh, uh, the, the uh, Adventist uh, headquarters. Uh, I don't want to mention where it is. And so uh, I was introduced to a man uh, with the, uh, AIDS already. And so uh, I assumed that he was a pastor. So I, told, uh, and I shake his hands and then, you know, nice to meet you, pastor. And then... You know, I was surprised when he said, Dr. Pa. It's, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I did not expect that. And so, uh, when you require honor and recognition that belongs only to our Heavenly Father, you are a hypocrite. And we want others to applaud a religious firm. So, uh, you know, that is uh, serious, uh, serious uh, connotations of uh, uh, being, uh, you know, being restless. When we are hypocrite, you know, it's a kind of a strong words to use. But it causes restlessness within the community. And it causes, you know, uh, uh, friction and it causes, you know, uh, uh, the idea of, you know, there is always that uh, commotion, the idea of uh, party against liberal and conservative uh, going against each other. Uh, and then you are in between. So uh, when in our in our in our thesis lesson is approaching restlessness. <clears throat> Let's uh, read for John fourteen one to six. In the midst of so much restless today, what are we to encourage to do in order that our hearts will not feel troubled? What is the key of overcoming divisions, selfishness, ambition, and hypocrisy? And to put it in other terms, what is the key to truly finding rest? Because our subject this quarter is about rest, and we're to, we talking about the, the cause of restlessness. And so, since Jesus is speaking in that context, how does the promise of the second coming impact our restlessness. So, uh, and then, how does Jeremiah 3.22 speak to the same issue? Let's read the text. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In my father's house has many rooms. If that were so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again. I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way, the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this text, in essence, and then uh, Jeremiah, let's read uh, Jeremiah here. Jeremiah 3, 2, return faithless people. I will cure you of backsliding. Yes, we will come to you uh, for you are the Lord our God. So here, Jesus is really trying the question that we have here is that to put in other terms, what is the key 
to truly finding rest. So the key to truly finding rest is we need to look at Jesus, the model of and to root out the, the restlessness in our lives. Because in Jesus' terminology, in Jesus' terms, to be great is to serve. Uh, to, to, in, instead of grasping, we need to give. Those are the antidote of uh, the roots of restlessness. And hypocrisy is that we need to be humble. And, you know, the, the promise of the second coming impacts restlessness. Because the idea of the second coming of Jesus Christ is that everything that we have here, position, possessions, material possessions, uh, because that is the story in, in the parable of Jesus Christ about the servant who was uh, gathering for himself. The story about ambition in the, the, within the disciples' community uh, where everyone wants to be number one. And uh, the story about, you know, selfishness, the idea. When we look at Jesus Christ, he is the antidote of all these problems that we are experiencing within the community, within the family. He is humble. He is self, you know, sacrificing. He is everything that we need in order to uproot restlessness in our lives. Because without him, we can never be rest. We can never, never rest. So uh, uh, this is uh, an, a fr- fr- Friday's discussion. Here, think about some practical ways of overcoming selfishness. Would it help us to keep each other accountable on this? You know, ambition is not wrong in or of itself. How can anyone anticipate and imagine Great things from God without falling into the trap of being consumed by ambition. And is there such a thing as godly ambition? How would you, how would that be different from a negative kind of ambition? And so uh, think about this. Because, uh, you know, uh, if you are here in the class, uh, this discussion week, interactions and exchange of ideas. Uh, but think about this question. Ambition is not wrong in and of itself. But is there such thing as godly ambition? So uh, how would that affect the different from negative kind? So uh, to deepen the impressions of this week's lesson, uh, of this week's lesson, here is a practical suggestion that I would like to uh, present here in order to, uh, you know, remedy the, the, the root of restlessness this, because we only have limited our discussion to selfishness, ambition, hypocrisy, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, stuff like that. Find a quiet place to be alone and ask God to help you seek, see a specific need in someone near you. Because if we only think about ourselves, then we are just like the, 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 the servant that in the Jesus parable about, you know, eat and drink and be merry. Very selfish. Once the Holy Spirit impresses you with this need in that person's life, ask God what you can do to meet that need. The act might be something as simple as inviting a lonely elderly neighbor over for supper, babysitting for a single mom, or comforting a person diagnosed with cancer, encouraging a young person, or tutoring a child. And this is one of the most fulfilling uh, experiences I had when I was, you know, volunteering uh, in the, in the, you know, in the community where there is a, a lot of, uh, you know, the family, ch- children are, 
underperforming because uh, they are not uh, really uh, up to date into what the uh, standard classrooms uh, that uh, requires them. So they have to go to this tutoring. And one time I was, uh, I was able to do this tutoring a child, a tour. And uh, towards the end of the school year, uh, it is a satisfying experience that you can see a child, uh, you know, flourish and, and, and you can see the potential because, you know, tutoring a child uh, to, to learn something is very valuable in their experience. Uh, also, uh, make a positive decision that you will give your time to bless someone else within your sphere of influence. As you bless someone else, you in turn will be blessed beyond measure. This is very true. When you help somebody uh, who, are in need, who is in need, or you can be a blessing to them, you yourselves being blessed beyond measure. You, 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 you try it. Uh, because uh, this is one of the key factors that, that, that remedy the, the, the causes of this restless uh, uh, you know, you know, experience, or experience we have in our lives. Do something. Uh, do something to others. Not except because, you know, I, I know somebody who is always thinking about herself or himself. And they, ask, they are the most miserable people about thinking about themselves only. They are the most miserable people. And so, in order to, you know, to approach that, uh, that restlessness, selfish, uh, looking at themselves only. Number three is one of the positive aspects, decision that you will give time to bless someone else. And then the, uh, here, <coughs> Ellen White said in Christ's Object Lesson, uh, Ellen White uh, says that <clears throat> there can be no growth of fruitfulness in the life that is centered in the self. If you have accepted Christ as a personal savior, you are to forget yourself and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ, tell of his goodness, do every duty that presents itself. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart and by every means in your power seek to save the lost. As you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the spirit that will ripen in your character, your faith will increase, your conviction deepen, your love be made perfect. More and more, you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. And so, uh, our last slide here, uh, that, that is our last slide today. And I hope that as uh, we think about this lesson, may it be that uh, uh, we focus and uh, grow in fruitfulness in the life of a saint, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> If you have accepted Christ as a personal savior, you are to forget yourself. Try to help others. And so that is our lesson for today. Uh, may it be that uh, you learn from, uh, uh, you know, to, to untangle the, the source or the roots of uh, restlessness that uh, we look upon Jesus Christ as our model. Uh, talk of love of Christ and tell others about his goodness. Let us pray. The Lord, this morning, thank you again for uh, the blessing of this lesson. Lord, uh, it opens. Uh, thank you for guiding us, leading us into the, the, the important principle that we may be able to realize that the, the lesson of the root of the self-restlessness is that we can have faith in you, that we can trust you, that you are the model of our uh, uh, service, that the idea of uh, you know, coming into uh, the presence of your love and receive the spirit of uh, humility, 
and service, the spirit of unselfish love, labor for others may grow in us and become as mature Christians. Thank you, Lord, for that blessing and privilege that you have afforded us. May it be that uh, you will guide us as we part from this uh, room today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.